Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most graceful, the most merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, a beautiful good morning to you and welcome to day two of the 2020 UAE Public Policy Forum. Once again, my name is Yusuf Abdelbari. I am a Dubai-based broadcast journalist and presenter. And I'm honored to welcome you to this platform on the second day of its launch, held under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Hamad bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Crown Prince of Dubai and Chairman of the Executive Council. And the strategic partner for this year's event is Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation. We would like to thank them for their unique input and insight. For those of you joining MBRSG, uh, it launched the UAE Public Policy Forum in 2017 as an annual knowledge and discussion platform for leaders and decision makers from federal and local government entities across the globe. This year, as it always does, MBRSG aims to showcase the trends, both lessons and failures in the best public policy practices and regulations, in their design and implementation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to stay tuned with us. We're about to commence our first session in less than a minute. We'll be right with you. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully that was punctual enough. Of course, are we all aware of yesterday's housekeeping notes? I would like, I'd appreciate uh, some interaction here from the audience with myself. We could also uh, get closer with each other. We don't have to be strangers. The chairs do not bite and the pictures will look more beautiful. So feel free to take the front seats, to be very honest. Think of it as a box cinema platinum experience. Now, uh, of course, I'd like to ask the gentleman in the back there just to show us the official hashtag for our UAE Public Policy Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, write it down on your hand if you don't trust your minds. It's hashtag UAE PPF 2020. This is your official hashtag and handle on social media, so you may use that. We'll remind you that we may have uh, polls to find out what your opinions are. The QR codes will be displayed on the screen as well, and we encourage you to participate. Those polls are our opportunity to be better with every cycle in every coming year. We appreciate your participation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we begin today's impulse discussing future economy labs. And by our first expert of the day, he is the Chief Strategist, Department of Economic Development from the Government of Dubai the United Arab Emirates. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Rashid Hazari. Your applause is appreciated. Assalamu alaikum. A very good morning. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, My subject today is about a practice that we have in implemented in the Department of Economic Development. It's an agile uh, practice that we are still implementing, piloting, and testing. I hope you will enjoy the discussion today. I'd like to start with uh, some estimates. Uh, we have had very enriching discussions yesterday about the fourth industrial revolution. There are some certain estimates which are talking about 50% of our workplaces will be automated by 2025. There are some certain estimates about 800 million jobs will be taken up by the robots by 2030. There are estimates, especially about our kids entering primaries today, 
when they get out to the job market, will not see 65% of the professions that exist today. So on the, with the onset of fourth industrial revolution, our world is changing. It is changing so much. It is creating complexity in our economies, in the way we live, work, play. It is also raising new challenges for us, challenges to which there are no easy answers, answers that demand collaborative actions, agility in our systems, adaptability in our systems to embrace these trends and move forward. I'll just take you back a bit from that far-fetched future. We're not talking about the changes that are ha just happening 5, 10, 15 years ahead. The changes are happening in our life today. Uh, zoom into the changes that are happening around us. We, now we are surrounded by the platforms which have changed the way we used to hail taxis. These are some of the examples. All of us are using them. We have seen the testing of flying taxis happening in Dubai. This could be a reality very soon. We have seen autonomous electrical pods roaming around in some of the areas. We have also seen the promise of Hyperloop, a 10 kilometer stretch, will be ready in 2020 itself. And again, Dubai has ambition to have 30% autonomous transport by 2030. All these changes have a greater implication. They're calling for agility in our systems, to change our systems, adapt to these new realities. The business models are changing. The way we govern our societies will change. So that calls for an agile system to be ready to embrace these trends. Are these trends only affecting a specific sector? I have picked up just a few examples from the transport sector. But these disruptions are happening across all the sectors. These disruptions are sector agnostic. Maybe the, the impact or the speed of disruptions is slightly differing from one sector to another sector, but it is pretty much dis disrupting everything. It is also disrupting the way the governments are run. Our journey, our story started with this particular study where we tried to engage business community. We engaged with around 60 odd business associations and councils to understand their challenge, to improve the engagement with them and resolve find solutions for their challenges. We also engaged governments to understand their perspective on this. We've collected a huge laundry list of issues and problems. This was two years ago. And we had an ambition to move the bar of engagement to higher levels. We understood there is a gap in the engagement, the way the engagement is done in Dubai. So we wanted to enhance the engagement. We wanted to improve, improve that collaboration with the business community. We wanted to empower them to be part of this uh, new policy creation. We could, we could hardly solve few of the, few of the problems given the, that the nature of the problem, the complexity of the problem, they were cutting across multiple mandates. So we felt there is a need for having a better system, a agile system, a collaborative approach to work together as a go government as a whole. We started uh, looking for best practices around the world we came across uh, especially the countries who are, who are doing very good on innovation index. We identified uh, the specific cities who are very good in, in the governance models. We mapped out their uh, approaches. We looked at these 16 different approaches from um, uh, Toronto, Copenhagen, London. Uh, we looked at MindLab from Copenhagen, which was one of the uh, first policy innovation we looked at uh, skill from Kent. We looked at different models. Our conclusion from this study was there are different, there are different ownership models available in certain countries. These uh, collaborative innovations are driven, completely driven by private sector. There are, certain, there are certain, certain examples where it is supported or driven by governments. We also learned what is required 
to enable these models to function. There was one interesting study published in uh, Government Summit in 2018. They published 100 such stories uh, jointly with OECD that what is the impact of these collaborative approaches. And uh, these success, success stories are available on the web. Then we went back and realigned our strategy to build this new agile system. We, we made sure that even in our DED corporate strategy, we had a foresight as an important objective even before we build, build our strategies. So to, for, this, for this new future economy system, we, we had important objectives of engagement. We wanted to be customer centric. We, we didn't want to bring some innovation happening elsewhere, copy paste here. We wanted to have the innovation built around the challenges of today, the, the new solutions solving current problems. We started our heavy foresight research and we started co-creating this environment along with, the, uh, with different parties. Our framework was built on some important principles of openness and transparency amongst the different players. Built on, it was centered around the business issues, business problems. We, we started connecting innovators inside and outside of the government. We started finding new ways of solving problems. We started testing and piloting systems and solutions. We defined a very clear foresighting methodology. The science is still evolving. There's no one answer of foresighting. We clearly charted our way how we are going to sense these trends. We call it as a sense-making process how we are going to dissect these trends, what are the different parameters to understand each trend, how these trends are gl globally affecting, disrupting the markets, where are the VC funding going. We also use some uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters to weigh these trends. Uh, how, what is the market size in different markets? What is the demand and supply locally, globally? So we had a clear process to understand how the trends are going. This was our result of our first study where we mapped out around 164 trends disrupting 14 important core sectors. For us, it was core sectors because uh, we looked at our licensing concentration. So licensing database concentration was in, into these 14 sectors within the circle. And we looked at, started mapping with the emerging technologies, how they're converging with the enablers of these 14 sectors and creating new products, new services, new business models. It was a very in-depth study. We are in a second phase now. In the second phase, we are trying to map around 300 different trends affecting these sectors. So it's an evolving approach, very data intensive. We're collecting around 10,000 data points to understand how these trends are moving, what is the direction of these trends. That has led to explore a lot of opportunities into existing sectors. We are producing uh, deep advisory on these 14 sectors that will be out in the next uh, couple of months. So we're trying to advise businesses, where are these trends moving? What are the new expected business models? And where we can find the new next new opportunity? And we're also trying to explore some new emerging trends leading to a large scale economic opportunities. We have conducted our cohorts on different subjects on your, on your right-hand side, you can see emerging sectors. In the first cohort, we attempted to find opportunities around the e-commerce, industry, university integration, digital economy, quantum computing, how quantum computing can be beneficial for economies, sharing economy, ed tech. And the second cohort is ongoing now. We have planned for 10 different subjects. We have started with circular economy, gaming, cashless economy. Basically, we. We place ourselves as thinkers, advisors, and content creators. We try to explore these opportunities and, and exchange this information with different government authorities to aware them about the subjects and the economic potential of these areas. When we look at these trends, we, look, we dissect these trends through our own methods and models. We look into the, the markets how these trends are creating those markets. Is the enough demand supply available here? What are the important players in this market? Who are the big global players who we can attract with? 
what is the funding models available uh, uh, locally and globally? How is the structure of the innovation, uh, innovation infra infrastructure? Do we have enough innovation in infrastructure to embrace this, develop this, nurture this technology? So this is kind of a gap assessment tool for us where we assess the maturity of, of our own market in comparison to the global markets. We also look into the regulations. We map out each regulations and see how they're interacting with, converging with the new trends if they, if they, uh, if they come and where we, need to, where we need to address the problems. We also test the mindsets. Of course, yesterday there were interesting presentations on behavioral insights and behavioral sciences. So we try to test the mindset and readiness of the culture to embrace these trends. In all our um, agile framework practice, we make sure that we, we don't just base um, these um, suggestions and recommendations on our own worldview. We try to map out all stakeholders who are part of that particular subject, be it from public sector, private sector, and academia. We bring them together, try to understand their worldview, how they see these subjects, how this will benefit them, and how we can leverage from the collective knowledge. So all our, all our methodologies are based on the principle of triple helix, where we try to collaborate all. Of course, we, have, we think we have created this agile system, which we are testing and adapting and implementing every day. It's very innovative, connected. We try to connect all the stakeholders, and we try to keep it as transparent as is possible. We're using innovative methods. We are looking for new approaches. We use uh, double diamond method, design thinking methodologies into this exploration journey. I'll, I'll just uh, want to show this video to give you a quick vibe of our sessions. Thank you for watching that. My counter is saying I have to get down off the stage. So I'll quickly wrap it up with, uh, of course, we have been uh, participated in this challenge and our, our practice has been assessed and recognized by the European Foundation. So quickly to wrap up, the call for action is the complexity and the uncertainty is increasing in our markets. We need to look for new methods. As, uh, as directed by His Highness, that this is the year for reflection. We need to, what has worked for the last 50 years might not work for the next 50 years. So there is a greater need to look for new methods. We have created this platform where we want to engage indiv individuals, institutions. We want to collaborate. If you have any challenge, if you have any new opportunity you want to explore with us, you're most welcome. With that, I'd like to leave the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hazari, for starting the day with some informative points, points at the present and points at the future. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> excuse me, allow me to continue with the first panel of the day, which we are heading to 
outer space, if we may. The discussion centers around moon to Mars and beyond. The moderator of this panel will be introducing the speakers in this discussion. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Professor of Innovation at MBRSG, Professor Melodina Stevens. Please welcome her. Let me very quickly introduce our panel. We have Sumaya from the UAE Space Agency. She looks after legislation. We have Donaldo Giorgi. He comes from Kness. Now, Kness is much older than NASA. <laughs> I don't know if it's really much older than NASA, but we're quite old. Uh, Kness is older than me. It was, crea it was created in 61. And they have the second largest budget, I believe, in the world compared to Per capita. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we have Dr. Jill. She comes from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Now, she writes on public policy with respect to outer space. Over the next one hour, we'll get to know our panelists a little bit better. What I would like to do is perhaps maybe just explain what our panel objectives are. Let me just start that again. So let me explain what the, our panel objectives are. We have four objectives, I hope, which we will achieve at the end of this. The first, what is the role of vision in agile governance? The second, what is the role of failure in agile governance? What is the role of teams? And last but not least, what is the role of governance? We're going to use space as an example, and my colleagues are going to try and illustrate from their various experiences how this actually works. We'll begin with, of course, UAE's recent announcement that we want to set up a colony in Mars. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Moonshots, which was actually started in the 1960s when Kennedy announced we will go to the moon. Well, we actually have a Mars shot, and Sumaya has brought a video which we would like to show. Could we play the video again? Thank you. Not this one.
which is space is about exploring the unknown, right? You need this vision to get it done. So how does this reflect with agile teams? What's so special about this? Sure. So uh, thank you, Dr. Melodine, for inviting me to the uh, panel today. And it's a really a great honor to be here this morning. And um, just to answer your question about the, um, how to have an agile government, one of the tensions, one of the three tensions of an agile government structure is to have a future proof policies. And looking into the Mars 2117, it's actually a futuristic vision. And it's a shape up all the policy and strategies in the sector, not only for the UAE space sector, uh, towards achieving that vision. So there are a number of elements which, um, which are like um, indirectly related to other sectors. Uh, or probably will stimulate um, uh, the progress of other sectors. For example, if you think about the Mars 2117 vision or building the first settlement, I'm, I'm actually in prefer to use the war settlement, not the war colonies. And one of them, for example, let's say um, uh, stimulating the technology readiness uh, on certain sectors, for example, 3D printing for building up the settlements. And this is involved with the um, uh, real estate sector, for example. And the other one is um, drilling materials or drilling technology, which we can, we can see the oil and gas are more involved into these technologies. So it's actually creating positive externalities to other sectors and engaging other sectors toward achieving that futuristic vision. So, I mean, Jill, let's look at this again. So when you have a vision, you don't actually reach there. Sometimes vision is like 10 years in line, maybe it's 50 years. How do I nudge teams forward? And Apollo is a great example because they had less than 10 years to put someone on the moon and they did not have the capability. Nudge is a great word. Um, one of the reasons I was really enthusiastic about coming here was this idea of agility, which I hadn't looked into too much in terms of research um, prior to this conference, but looking back at space exploration, I think we have this idea that it was all about firsts and achievements and the first person on the moon, the first uh, space station, the first person in space. And that's a narrative, a historical narrative that we have placed onto space exploration in the past, when in reality, it was a much slower, more gradual process. It was agility, um, there were failures, there was a process. And uh, one of the things I get asked about a lot as somebody who researches in this area are these sort of milestones in space, like the introduction of commercialization in space or the shift towards um, the second space race between the US and China. I think that those are false narratives. In fact, everything is much more gradual but we, we don't like to think of it like that. I think people like the idea of these grandiose achievements, but in reality, it's much more of this gradual process. So there are teams behind that are creating the baseline to achieve great results is what I'm actually hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Do you have examples, Donato? Well, um, <coughs> Chile must say that I don't agree 100% when you okay. say that it's mm -hmm. gradual. Um, the change uh, is often political and it comes from a political decision. You were talking about commercialization. Uh, in 2006, the United States decided uh, to implement a program called COTS, a Commercial Operation Transport Service, something like this, sorry. Um, and it really changed the paradigm of space because this is what made the, what we call now the new space start. Uh, why? What happened? Um, the administration at that time, I think it was administration Bush, uh, decided to uh, serve the International Space Station through a different way, in, in a different way. Uh, the shuttle was getting older, very expensive. It showed that it was dangerous. Um, one flight of the space shuttle could cost one billion dollars each flight. Um, so what they decided to do was to externalize uh, the, the work of building shuttles, uh, capsules, or ser services. The, the government decided to become not the builder of, and the owner of uh, the transportation means, but the client of services. So they decided to externalize uh, the 
refueling the, refer the, the cargo services to the International Space Station. That was a, cha a, a mongoose change in the space paradigm because this one started something that we know today as SpaceX. SpaceX started with funding, public funding, uh, that came from that program. This changed the way of seeing uh, the role of uh, public institutions, space agencies. And it has evolved so much that the whole world is following somehow, um, giving, recognizing as well that the industry is mature enough to take more responsibilities. So I'm just curious, is this a bad thing that we outsource to private sector? No, no, I, I mean, it's the point of view. If you ask an engineer from a space agency, they will say, no, it's too risky, it's very bad, because as well, they lose the responsibility. But in reality, in many sectors, it's already the case. You don't need, when the industry is mature enough, you don't need any more institutional entities to take charge. So you need to, um, you have the opportunity to give more responsibility to industry, to the private sector, and make out of technology development, institutional missions, commercial activities that can develop the economy. So this is a Personal good question, opinion. I think, on private-public partnership, because this is where we're actually going. Space is huge. We don't know what's out there. I don't think governments can do it alone by themselves, so it requires collaboration. But we also need private sector, if I'm Absolutely. hearing things carefully. Maybe I'll come to you, Jill. How do we get collaboration at an international level? And then, Sumaya, maybe you'd want to add to that, too. Yeah, I would just... This is I know you don't agree, a bit of please. A conflict <laughs> is good, that, I the one think, thing when I would you have panel that, members. That <laughs> I think people underestimate the degree to which the private sector has always been involved in space activity. Mm -hmm. I mean, since the 1970s, for example, in the United States, um, they, they were bringing in research and development from the private sector. And um, I, this is an area, I, I think sometimes in people's minds, there's a dichotomy between government and private and commercial, but in reality, with space in particular, I think it's a unique industry that requires an overlap between the two because the private sector doesn't have the funding, frankly, and the government um, doesn't have the innovation. So it's a real opportunity and it has uniquely been an area where the two have, over, have overlapped. Okay, Sumaya, what do you think? Well, um, as, as, we, as we progress in time, we can notice that space is becoming more um, competitive, uh, um, con uh, contested and more actually condensed. So looking into all of these uh, recent trends and developments, we can see that there is an importance of having or including the, or privatize some of the activities um, that is going on in the space sector. And this is really good because competition actually raises quality, uh, bring prices down, increasing the access to space, including the element of innovation, totally agree. And as well, there's a role for government to be more focused on the policy, creating the proper business environment for these in, in, uh, private institution to prosper for, uh, further, uh, creating uh, more opportunities to access to finance, maybe investments, or bringing or work as a catalyst or a platform to bring investors along with the private entities and startups, and um, probably enhance the um, um, intellectual properties and all of these things that is required uh, by the space sector just to prosper and develop as well. Okay, so I just want to recap a little bit. When they went to the moon, it, it required, I'm reading some of the reports right now, they did it in nine years. They had about half a million people working behind the scenes to put astronauts on the moon, but they had 200,000 companies, private sector companies that were outsourced just to make that happen. So this is a great example of how one project of a vision requires so much of maybe coordination, yet, it's 50 years and we have not been to the moon again. So I'm going to ask you, Donato, why? Why? I mean, we have this great vision. We could do it, but we've not gone back. So what went wrong somewhere along the way in our space exploration? Well, I don't believe it's about something went wrong or went well. It's a matter of, again, I believe, uh, political choice. A destination is uh, can be a political choice, can be 
and, and the choice decision, the decision can be made on grounds of science, science interest, can, ma can be made on the grounds of national pride, security, defense, economy, etc. And the choice of going back to the moon uh, can be read as going to the moon, it's easier than going to Mars. And before going to Mars, which requires, for example, a trip of few people, we're, we're talking about people going far. Uh, it requires seven to nine months trip in space uh, outside the, not just the Earth, but outside the magnetic, magnetic field that protects Earth. Earth. Uh, a trip of seven months to Mars will put the, uh, the future astronauts in a situation that can be quite dangerous for their health, uh, radiations, uh, confinement for seven months. Uh, can you imagine staying in a very confined space with three, four, five people for seven months? That can be <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> for me, sometimes it's difficult to stay in a meeting for one hour with some people, <laughs> so you can imagine seven months. Um, going to the moon, it's easier and can prepare to go to Mars. But of course, it's a choice. If you go to the moon, your arrival on Mars will, be, will come later because to go to the moon, you'll have to spend budgets, dedicated budgets that otherwise would have spent to go to Mars. Uh, it's a choice and it's a choice that the United States who are the lead in this effort, uh, I'm French but I'm talking about the United States, that's very weird. <laughs> um, uh, the choice of the United States is based on several grounds but the first one is political. Let's go back to the moon, show that we can do it. But it takes a lot of time because those people who build the missions to the moon, they're not in service anymore. So this is knowledge that was lost. The documentation probably was lost in some uh, uh, warehouses in, I don't know, in Arkansas or in Texas. So this knowledge has to be rebuilt with the new technologies that we have. So if you want to go back to the moon, it will take time and we've seen this. There was a first program called Constellation. It was abandoned because of different reasons. Then the Obama administration decided to try something different, asteroid. Then they decided to go back to, to the moon. And today we know that uh, in principle there should be a man and a woman landing on the moon in 24. And if I, if I may hi highlight as well, there's um, an international exploration roadmap where its ultimate goal is to go to Mars yes. and the moon is actually a stop in the middle. And the moon is used as a platform to test all of the technologies to achieve a very high technology readiness level. And once it's ready, then they will just simply implement it to Mars. And the reason is in Mars, there are cer some certain challenges going to Mars. First of all, 50% probability of mission failure is there. So 50% of the mission has failed and 50% has succeeded. And the second reason, there is no atmosphere on Mars. So in terms of landing, there are some challenging, uh, it's a very challenging landing over there. So most of the mission actually crash. Mm -hmm. And the third challenge would be uh, the communication payload. The communication over there, there is a communication delay of 20 minutes. So w most of the mission depends on the um, spacecraft to, uh, to function automated, um, um, on an automation basis. So there's a lot of use of AI, artificial intelligence and automation and programming. So those three challenges are usually um, associated whenever there's a mission to uh, a Mars landing. But then all of these are actually tested on the moon since it's closer. And then later on it will be implemented to achieve missions to Mars. So I think you bring in a very interesting concept, the concept of experimentation, testing, and future foresight, because you're actually predicting what could be problems to ensure that we have a higher success rate. And I think we've got some good examples actually from policy, from space, right, where we've seen this kind of agility and the thinking. Could you mention some of them, Jill? Absolutely. What was interesting, listening to you guys, you were addressing some of the scientific um, challenges, but 
it, there's also policy issues here in terms of governance. So if you're not familiar, um, outer space is actually governed by five main treaties that were um, established in the 1960s and 70s. So they're, they're quite well established. And there's some questions about how we might work around them. But in general, they do establish uh, norms for behavior on celestial territory. So probably the main one is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And it says that no country may lay claim to any celestial body or celestial territory. So in addition to these scientific challenges, we have um, a governance structure that we need to think about, um, which says that I think the ethos of it is that outer space activity should be collective and collaborative. But we're seeing difficulties with that, not only in the fact that um, there are more countries that are going up out into space, but also that it's not just countries as a, a single entity, um, but again, public-private pri partnerships. So the legal infrastructure is very much focused on this idea of the launching state and individual countries, yet in reality, there's, um, it's, it's more complicated. So I think that we can unwrap that legally, but it is causing us some um, legal, ethical, philosophical challenges in terms of potentially um, going to other planets. So one of the examples actually in space is currently right now, we treat it like Antarctica, nobody owns space. It's for everybody. Every country has equal rights to it. But there is a loophole in the law that allows, I think, private sector companies to own parts of space that they go and visit. So when we're talking about legal issues, yeah, Samaya, you have a point. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the common heritage of mankind, which is the principle uh, stated in the uh, outer space treaties uh, and the principle of non-appropriation. And I understand that um, the space resource utilization has been an issue of controversy in the recent decade, um, of especially in the recent five years. So the, U the, US, the United States has issued um, an act that allow the ownership of these space resources by private companies. And the reason is to create this legal certainties for these companies to come over and, and, and legal certainty as well to the investors to invest in these uh, private companies. And the other thing, um, the, the, uh, we have Luxembourg has followed that and so is the UAE, uh, since we are seeing that this is a, an actual potential. And um, during the past year, and even recently, last week, during the United Nations, um, the, during the, the, the last year legal subcommittee within the United Na Nations um, Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, it was actually added as an agenda uh, within, within the discussion. And we can see that more countries are now accepting the concept of space resources utilization, uh, we have different academic efforts to define a legal framework on how to um, uh, regulate uh, such, um, a new segment, uh, such, such a new topic as well, since it is like um, uh, creating these futuristic opportunities for space, uh, space settlements and including Mars 2117 as well. So Donato, I think a, a job is actually about negotiation, right? You, have, you spend a lot of time in agile governments <coughs> working in areas you don't have authority for. And then it's about getting people to accept your point of view and say this is for the greater good. How do you do this? Is it easy? And what skills do we require for this? <laughs> <laughs> um, easy is not really the word to be used for this kind of activities. Um, I spent, in particular, a few years negotiating within the space framework of Europe. Um, you, I suppose you perfectly know the organization of Europe in space, which is very easy. Member States, European Space Agency, European Union with different responsibilities. Uh, it's not easy at all. It's very complicated even for Europeans. Um, once I was talking to an American colleague and said, I want to discuss this topic, so I'll speak to the European Space Agency. I said, no, it's not the European Space Agency, it's the European Commission but the European Commission doesn't do this, doesn't do that. So the situation is very complicated. To that, you add the fact that there are 22 member states with ESA, 27 now with the European Union, 
Negotiation is uh, the daily activity when you want to have a program to be decided and to progress. And 27 countries, plus the European Commission, plus the people of ESA, uh, means at least 27 different identities, 20 27, 27 plus plus um, goals, objectives, uh, and justified uh, different needs or different interests. But the point is that, that if you want to get a program approved, you need to have everybody to agree on it. And to have everybody to agree on, uh, on a project, uh, you have as well to, remem to remember that you're, these are people that you're going to work for the future on other projects too. The first rule that you learn is that never make an adversary, an adversary, an enemy. You will see these people in the future, in any case, first. Second, when you talk about negotiation inside the European Union, uh, it comes quite naturally that even if you have very different point of view, you have different interests, industrial, political, uh, scientific, uh, eventually you have a common goal, which is building the same house. Uh, this is how we like to think of the European Union. Eventually, you will find a way to find a solution that is a win-win solution. You never make an adversary an enemy, and whatever solution eventually you will find. And trust me, this final solution is always far from being perfect, and nobody likes it, but everybody accepts it. Because there is something that is good for everybody, and something that is a little bit less good for each of us. But it's a solution that eventually will uh, create, generate results. And talking about space, this is how we progressed in the last 50 years, uh, let's say even 60. Um, and if you see the results of European space, it shows that with, I'll talk about the States again, with 10 times less budgets than the United States, We've been competitive internationally. We have an industry that is leader on, the ma on some markets. Uh, we've been, even with the complications of Europe, we made something that is very efficient. Little money, complicated system, efficient results. I think this raises an interesting point. We don't need lots of money to achieve big goals. I mean, we can see this with some of the space missions right now, which is very frugal and reaching there. How do we get that mindset change? Do we need that mindset change? I don't know. That's a difficult question, I think. I, I, I would just come in briefly here. One of the things, so I've been researching in this area for 20 years. I think people are more aware of the fact that space is financially viable, independent of anything else. Like space infrastructure is good business. It's, it's big money. So it's not just about the noble purposes of going out for science and research, but investing in space is good economics. So we talk a lot about spin-offs, right? So space mm -hmm. has a lot of spin-offs. Can you give me some examples that you think have benefited mankind? If, um, if I may. So for example, um, there's a lot of investment that's happening or um, being put on the R&D for space activities. And then um, the best way to maximize the return of this investment is to open up the um, technology as a spin-off, which, uh, which are incorporated in our daily lives. And um, this is the best way to maximize this um, return of the investment that has been made for space. And um, uh, one example of a spin-off, for example, at touch screens, which is in everyone's phone right now, and it's something that you cannot just, um, uh, I cannot imagine to go back to my old phone with, with the buttons and all, <laughs> just like my grandmother's style. It was like this. Yeah. <laughs> <it's> <laughs> 
Well, I, I actually uh, witnessed uh, this sort of phone with the, with the rotator as well. But the thing is... She's um, very young, or we're very old. I don't know which way it goes. <laughs> well, I'm 25. I've been 25 for the past seven years, so yes. Um. So the thing is, um, to ma this is the best way. I mean, spin-off. I love spin-offs. It's the way on how to maximize the return of the investments. And uh, something which is new that we, the UA Space Agency is measuring as well, um, uh, the the the, um, the spin-on as well. So the technology which are made on Earth for the purpose of serving uh, something on Earth, but then somehow used in space. For example, uh, artificial intelligence. That's one 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 thing that we are trying to incorporate in space as well. So we've got it going both ways. We've got stuff that we made for space that we're using on Earth, and vice versa. That's right. Okay, so I probably want to get very quickly to the next point. I would love to do a poll. Can we switch to the poll? So should space colonies, and it, well, we're not supposed to use colonies, so should space settlements, settlements. for example, <laughs> if people live in other parts of the solar system, if they're living on the moon and we call them moonlings, or maybe we live on Mars and they're called Martians, what kind of government should they have? Should the government be the same as on Earth? That means a UAE government, a US government, a French government, or should Mars have a different government? So do you think it should be the same one? That's a great question. One person says no, <laughs> but that's a big crowd. <laughs> and <I'm thinking laughs> this is also agile decision making is take a decision. <laughs> three yeses. This is like the Brexit. You have to vote if you want to make your feelings felt. I'm like on my edge. What's going to happen? This is great. Well, so I see there are 24 future astronauts in the, cr cr in the crowd here. <laughs> really interesting. So we are, I think it looks like most people feel we should have a new government. No, we should have the same government. That, that's what I would wonder is, what kind of percent of countries, so if you're no, who should it be? Okay, so let's, let's discuss this a little bit because I think this comes to an interesting point. What does it mean to be human? And what values do we want in outer space? Because we're going to promote it. So I'm going to actually, Jill has another role. She heads METI. And maybe you could explain what METI is. Sure, yeah. So one of the things that I, I know it sounds eccentric, um, but I worked, work in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, so SETI is what most people know it as. And so um, this is, the idea that we're looking to see if there's anything else out there in the universe. And the thing is within the community, the research community that I work in, there's a, a really big split between people who think we should just listen. So just look for potential communication from extraterrestrial intelligence. And then there are people who think that we should be sending messages out. And so the difference is SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, versus METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's, it's really a very emotive topic, and a lot of people feel very strongly about it. I am involved on the side that is sending messages out. And I'll be honest with you all, I don't think we will ever make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, but to me, the process of thinking about how we represent ourselves as a human community to communicate out into space is a worthy project in and of itself. So it's a philosophical and an ethical project. Who are we? 
if we were to make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence, how would we represent ourselves? So to me, the messaging extraterrestrial intelligence has value in and of itself in that way. So I find this poll really, really interesting. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in is, you know, if we, if we go out there, um, even if we just go to settle, not colonize, Mars, do we go there as a company or a country or an individual? Um, and I don't have any answers, um, but I think it's a really interesting question and it's something that I love talking to people about. Um, because, yeah, who, who are we and how do we represent ourselves? No um, answers. Donato, I think your organization does some exciting things in this field. Would you like to share? <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's the point when you have uh, information or news you cannot understand, especially if you have somebody that calls you because you're the French Space Agency in France, uh, and they say, hey, I saw an UFO. It was an UFO. Uh, I'm not dreaming. I'm not crazy. Uh, I saw that UFO. And sometimes they come with um, evidence, pictures, videos. The point for us uh, was that point to make sure that we were able to understand what happened in reality. So we created a small specialized team to give us answers and to give the public answers. Those who had uh, who sought or thought they had seen uh, UFOs. It has been probably 30 years that this entity called Japan um, collected, um, uh, collected this information given by people who had seen or thought they had seen uh, UFOs in France. It's an entity that works, uh, it's a very small bureau within CNES, the French Space Agency, uh, that works with uh, police, uh, that works with other government, gov governmental entities, that works with scientists, that works with engineers, in order to collect the information necessary to understand if the UFO site could be, can be explained. Uh, let's say that there has been, I think, probably 8,000 8, events uh, s uh, told to the JPAN, and up to today, uh, there is, there's, I think, 4% only of those 8,000 8, that have been unresolved. There's a part of them that is that the evidence was so limited that there was no investigation possible. This shows the need to understand. Uh, this shows as well that we don't know if there are uh, aliens or not. Uh, it's today um, either, either personal choice, you believe that the universe is so big that it, it's impossible that it is j here just for us. Um, it goes to uh, ideas of the governments are hiding something from us. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're trying to show that it's not the case. So I think this is interesting. I, I, I want to take it from a customer perspective point of view. How many of us have got calls from somebody and we think, ah, oh, crazy person sitting on the other <laughs> line and telling yeah. us things. This is a great example. You're getting calls from people who have seen things and then you have to have a dialogue with them, right? Yeah. So I is this something that we would want in future governments, this agility to talk and to respond and to document? I don't know, because we talk about transparency and trust. So the tensions, yesterday I think Her Excellency Huda mentioned that there is a tension between working constantly and keeping stability, and this is very hard. How do we manage this tension? Um, the, the work of JPAN and this office is based uh, was structured with a team of psychologists because uh, you first need to understand who's the person you're talking to. Uh, if it's a delusional person or if it's somebody that has other problems or if it's somebody, which is m most of the cases, 
somebody that, uh, that really saw something. And then you have to show to the person that uh, you trust them and you want to understand with them. And this is what we do. And eventually, uh, there, the, the explanation of most of the cases are complicated, but once you know the technology, when you know the environment, and when you have the tools to explain this, eventually there's sim sim simply physical effect. So I think again we highlight space has a lot of unknowns with us. It has. I'm going to show a video that you actually brought for us. Um, I think that was a powerful video. And most of us said we want a different type of governing style in space. We see that we've made a lot of mistakes on Earth. Most of you know about the SDGs. I don't think we're going to achieve the SDGs by 2030. What are things that we would want to do differently? So what are some of those principles by which we would want to govern future settlements in space? And I thought before I even begin, I'd show you this picture. Um, most of you know about this. This is Tesla. And this is a water bear. And this is a picture of nanocube satellites in space. We call them space junk. junk. <laughs> so all three are common. They're called space junk. By the way, the water bears are on the moon. There was a satellite that... Uh, uh, a spacecraft that crashed on the moon last year, and they spread the water bears around. These animals live in dormant conditions until water actually comes and brings them back alive. So already polluting other planets or other places. What should change, and how do we manage this transition? Because if we can't achieve SDGs on Earth, how are we going to do it in space? If I may allow, so um, the United Nations Resolution on the Sustainable Development Goals, um, paragraph 76, 
recognize the importance of outer space as an enabler to achieve the sustainable development goals, specifically on remote sensing and earth observation. And mainly it's related to the monitoring of the earth atmosphere um, and how can, um, uh, well, all of, uh, well, this paragraph has been somehow uh, transparent within the um, United Nations Office of Outer Space and the United Nations Committee of the, on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, COPIUS, um, into a different agenda that are discussed within these two forums. One of these agendas is related to the uh, long-term sustainability of space, which are handling uh, topics related to space debris or regulations related to the contamination of other celestial bodies, like the moon, for example, and with all of these missions. And the, and the other one is uh, related to the Space 2030, which is more like a strategy or a roadmap on how space would look like within the next um, decade. So this is how sustainable development goals is somehow transferred or uh, transformed into the space community. So um, looking into, for example, new topics, well, space is innovative, new, and there are new, new development every day, new technology. For example, who would thought about CubeSat constellation in thousands, 10 years ago, and today it's like filling the um, orbits and astronomers are complaining about the star these, um, um, the constellation right now that they are actually blocking the uh, view on, on astronomy uh, observations. Maybe uh, for, the, for the audience, those lines are actually satellites. So now it's not possible to look at outer space with telescopes very easily because these tiny satellites reflect the light and they create maps like this. Yeah. But we have a bigger problem. When you go to space, you need a clear window in which to launch rockets or to place large satellites. And this is not easy, is it? So f for the clear window, it's mainly the, um, um, it's an orbital mechanic, more of like um, a, a safety corridor or a launching corridor towards the destination. And uh, this is usually done by one challenging, um, w one thing which is very challenging in design of these, the corridor is what's going on there in space? Who's orbiting and uh, what are the space debris? What are the junk and how can we avoid them during the space mission? And um, uh, there are a number of um, um, initiatives towards uh, in the international community to define uh, principles on debris mitigation guidelines, which are currently voluntary. And um, those principles are on the national, on the international level, and now is transferred on the national level. So we see other space agencies and other regulator um, issuing policies and requirements on a voluntary basis to encourage the sector or the private sector to comply to these space debris mitigation guidelines. And the UAE as well um, uh, is creating a number of incentives, like for example, facilitation of the uh, authorization process of, of uh, space activities for those who are complying to the space debris mitigation guidelines, as well that it will reduce the third party liability insurance. So we know that space activities, uh, every uh, as per the international treaties, every state is liable towards their activities, even if it was conducted by the private sectors and private companies owned by the state. So usually the state transferred this liability through an insurance policy or an insurance requirement to these companies. So as they are complying to the space debris mitigation, the insurance value decrease, and the reason is the risk associated with that space activity decrease as well. So those are the sort of incentive and flexibility within the um, regulatory framework. Jill, do you want to add? Yeah, um, I guess just kind of summing up as we come, I, I was just thinking the reason I became interested in researching this area is because I feel like space activity taps into the extremes of humanity. There's this beautiful, noble exploration um, going out, and then there's also the security element, military element. And in that sense, it's act the extremes of humanity. But I think increasingly, it's also now day to day. Space is part of our everyday lives. And that's a good thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the infrastructure that we rely on. It's part of our economy. Um, but that means that there are complications in terms of how we want to approach it in terms of governance. Um, and I don't think we should abandon the infrastructure, that we, the legal infrastructure that we have before that's pre-existing, but that is very uh, country-centric. 
And as for the poll that you took, we need to think about ways to unpack that in order to move forward. And I would bring this back again to agility because in terms of space, again, we like to think about these big achievements, but in reality, there's this um, iteration that's behind it all, um, that's backing it up, that's really quite every day. Um, and although that's not as exciting um, as these focusing on these big achievements, the reality is that there's this underlying ticking over that re uh, applies to you know science and technology and governance and law, but they are all the things that are building this platform on which we can exploit and explore uh, a resource that hopefully humanity will make the best of in the future. Thank you. Don Alto? Um, if I think of science mi missions, just to provide an example, um, we applied in the past, uh, and we keep applying to them, what we call planetary protection. These are a series of procedures that are supposed to make whatever mission that goes to the moon, to, a, to Mars, or to another planet, sterile, completely sterili sterili sterilized. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you send a, a probe to the moon, to, ma to Mars, in order to discover life there, but in your probe, there are bacteries or uh, uh, other viruses or whatever that is molecules that come from Earth. And these are basically components of the basic life. For sure, if the probe lands on Mars with these molecules, particles, uh, uh, eventually, you, you can say, I have found traces of life on Mars. Yes, because you brought it from Earth. <laughs> That's why every time we plan to send a probe on the surface of, uh, of a planet, we make sure that it's sterilized. And it's a very costly pro uh, procedure, extremely complicated. But it's always an uh, imperative part of um, a mandatory part of a scientific mission. Today we see that we made many efforts, but the risk is that in the future, and already because of failures, these efforts can be useless eventually. So that's really worrying. Uh, you talk about the water bears. Uh, in 50 years, there will be people on the moon and they, they would find traces of, uh, of Earth on the moon. Well, in any case, even without the water bears, uh, the American missions left so many traces over there uh, that it's difficult to uh, say, uh, was there anything on the moon before? Well, we know the answer, there was nothing on the moon before. <laughs> uh, but we need to be much more careful about Mars uh, because if we start having traces of somehow very basic entities of life from Earth, on Mars, we will not have the answer we want. We will have uh, wrong, wrong information. Uh, I think we're almost at the end of our panel. Very quickly, I just want to recap. So we did see vision plays an important role in agile government, but it's about the process of getting to achieve those visions that's important. There is experimentation with that, and one side is failures we ha and how we learn from that. We did understand that we cannot do it by ourselves. We need teams. And of course, we talked about the importance of governance when dealing with the unknown, because this is extremely critical. We don't know about anything over there in the future, but planning for it is important. So Maya, just before we wrap up, for the next 50 years, what has UAE planned? And maybe you could even say it in sure. Arabic if you want. So um, currently we have issued our national space strategy and it's like a 10 year strategy until the period of um, 2013. And this year we are working on defining what would be the future of space for the next 50 years. And this will be based on this strategy and as well it will be based on the um, um, future foresight study that we have conducted and the plausible scenario that has been identified towards achieving the Mars 2117 vision as well. And um, um, 
looking into this space, what, what are the lessons learned from space to the other sector? Um, there is a very interesting concept which are used by mission planning in mission planning, which is the concurrent design facilities. And it's like combining all different, uh, different teams within a space mission. So we see economists talking with engineers, we have scientists talking with lawyers in the same room and moderated by the same moderator. And this is that, that we are trying to do. We are like bringing everyone in the, in the industry, whether if it was on the national level or the international level, private sector, governments, all together and having this strategic conversation towards shaping this future. Because future is, only, is all about having this same mindset and the same strategic conversations. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the panel and thank our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for moderating that discussion, and thanks, of course, to our expert speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, the most interesting point in that talk, of course, was uh, our aspirations to the future, and specifically when we've seen the footage about what we plan to do in outer space. Back in the old days, um, we've never thought outside of the box, we've never thought outside of this planet, which is the first box we ever inhabited. And the idea of inhabiting other areas is just mind-blowing, believe me or not. What a time to be alive. Ladies and gentlemen, allow us now to move to our next impulse of the day. Exploring data visualization for policy decision making. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Jose Ber uh, Berengueres from the UAE University. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Please welcome him. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the slides. Great, so let me ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with uh, death by PowerPoint? Can you raise your hands? And death by Excel? Right, and Tableau? Right, so I'm going to talk about data visualization and how you can use it to think more and to convince more people. But first, I want to play a game. Can you guess the missing word? Anybody? It's data. If you want to convince people, you need data, yes? The problem is that data usually looks like this, and it will leave people feeling like this. And if you want to convince them, you, you need to make them excited, right? Hence, data visualization. The second problem is that there is a lot of bad, bad data visualization. I'm going to show you some examples from the internet. Uh, this is a chart representing the 100 most acti active accounts. Wrong chart for the job. This is another chart, number of data scientists per country. Information overload. And my favorite, the useless chart. So. I am a professor, and as an academic, I went on a quest to find out why we have so much bad visualization. And I found out the culprit. School dropout, never took a design course, yet his software is used to produce 90% of the charts that you will see in your life. That he is not the only at fault here, as the education system, we also have blame on this. Because 
to do data visualization, you need data skills, but you also need design skills. But the data guys, they look like this. And the designers look like this, and they don't go to the same schools. And the schools where they teach data, they don't have design, and vice versa. And there's very, very few schools where they teach both well. So to fix this, I'm going to give you six rules to be awesome at data visualization. Number one, tell me a story. When you make a chart, tell me a story. Because if you say something, some people will remember. If you make a chart, more people will remember it. If you make a story out of it, it's even better. Number two, know the difference between data and information. What is the difference? Second exercise, can you order these four keywords? Give you five seconds. First information, then data, then knowledge and wisdom. Okay, when I give this to my students, most of them come up with this arrangement. So what, what makes them arrange words like this? What's the difference? What's the attributes of data versus wisdom? So data is abundant, there is a lot of data. Wisdom is, it's a scarce, and it's valuable, right? And this arrow is called the arrow of value. Number three, know how to create knowledge. What is knowledge? This pyramid is called the data information knowledge wisdom model. And how do you transform data into information? Well, one way is to summarize, to reduce overload. How do you transform information into knowledge? Right. So. One way is to get your new information that you found and put it in context to relate it to other bodies of existing knowledge. That's how Einstein got his Nobel Prize. And what is wisdom? Yes. Right. So one guy told me, Jose, if you want to be a leader, it's not only what you say, it's when you say it. That's wisdom. And there's two thinking modes here. You need an exploratory thinking mode, what in design thinking we call divergent thinking. And then you need a different thinking mode, conversion thinking. Number four, if you make a chart and nobody likes it on Twitter, did it really happen? No. Let's say you have this chart. How do you make it more memorable? Use pop culture. For example, personas. Number five, understand how to use narratives in a chart or in a presentation. What is the relationship, what is the role between these three elements? Well, the role of data is to lend credibility to your story. What's the role of the story? To advance the narrative. And what is the narrative in this tale? That we want to teach our kids not to trust strangers. But you cannot go to a five-year-old and tell him that. You need to wrap it in a story. It works also for adults. Can you identify the narrative, the story, and the data here? 350 million is the data. This is the story that we send money out, and the narrative is, let's take back control. Fake numbers, but very effective. Number six, choose a chart that is compatible with what you want to say. For example, this is data, gender breakdown of data scientists worldwide. If I ask people to visualize this, most people come up with this chart. Histogram. Some of the people come up with this chart, a pie chart. Others come up with this one, bar chart. What is the problem with the pie chart here? What is a pie? It's a metaphor for a cake. What happens when you have 50 kids 
around a cake. There's going to be a fight. It's the scarcity narrative. So you have to be careful if your chart is compatible with what you want to say. A more neutral chart is the stack bar. But it's kind of boring. How would you make it more interesting, memorable? Well, we can use personas. In the case, we chose uh, superheroes. And remember, if they don't remember it, it didn't happen. So whenever you can, dramatize. So I'm going to show you two examples of very, very improbable presentations. A few years ago, Elon Musk was talking about solar panels. He wanted to promote solar panels. He said, we just need to cover one pixel of the USA to fulfill our energy needs. Well, this presentation was a flop. Why? Well, can you trust something that you don't see? And second, what is the narrative here? Which piece of land are we going to use for this? Is it going to be your land or your land? Same purpose, different strategy. A few years earlier, a German company called QCells used a similar chart like this one. It's a different narrative. Look at how much solar energy hits the Earth in one year. It's so many. Let's use some of, some of it. So very same purpose, different charts, different outcome. Another one. This is CO2 emission concentration. And this is temperature. And this is Al Gore. And this is a lift. They put Al Gore on a lift to show that the concentrations are off the charts. This presentation got 62,000 views on YouTube. Few, few years later, professor from the UK, Ed Hawkins, takes less data and creates this chart, a spiral chart. He posts it on Twitter. It went viral in minutes. Temperatures spiraling out of control. But then comes my favorite person, ignores all these charts, and tells us a story. And what's the story here? Hey, I have to go to this climate conference, but I'm not going to jet because I have integrity, and I want to reduce my carbon footprint. And what's the data here? Look at these big waves behind me. They look so menacing. This is dangerous. This is an emergency. So same data, three dif different ways to tell the story, three different outcomes. So summarizing, if you want to be awesome at data visualization, first, tell me a story. Second, data is not information. Third, know how to create knowledge. Four, Make it memorable. Five, use narratives. And six, choose a chart that is compatible. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so I guess now the master of ceremonies will take over. Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving the stage back for me, of course, and a special thank again to uh, our wonderful Dr. Wrightback. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after this food for thought Dr. Jose just gave us, why don't we take a 15-minute break outside in the foyer, and we'll look forward to seeing you back after that time. Enjoy it. There's a lot of caffeine, and there are some sandwiches outside, so bon appetit. <laughs>